Good morning, people. Assalamu alaikum. I am just pulling up my computer so that I can make sure that I'm able to see the questions. I see you can see my little light here too. That's good. I want to make sure that I can um I can see your questions as you ask questions. Let me I am live here on the page, but I want to make sure that I, everybody in the group knows, or in the event knows that we are live. So we'll give people a couple more minutes to log on because I have lots of exciting and interesting information to share. So I want to give people a minute and I want to figure out how I'm going to be able to see questions. Oh, I see. I am good. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, Barakisa, I hope I pronounced that right. Uh, wa alaikum salam. Um, so, We're going to give people a couple minutes. Okay. Oh, good. I did pronounce it right. Awesome. All right. And I can see your comments, and that's the important part. <laughs> okay. So um, let me see if I can make that bigger on my screen so I can make sure I can see everybody's comments. Awesome. I think I can see. Oh, good. And I can see comments. All right. So me and my... And you can see my computer, see? All right, so I can see you, you can see me, you can hear me, and that is the most important part. So today is about, what are we, about three weeks in front of Ramadan. So I thought that this would be a great time to just remind people of some of the health benefits of Ramadan so we can start preparing ourselves, not just spiritually, but physically as well. So I'm really excited to present this uh, chat with you today because over the last year or so, since last Ramadan, I have just been reading so much information about fasting. Now, I was born and raised Muslim, and I know we get lots of lectures and lots of halakhas about the spiritual benefits of fasting. So I am not going to go into this about the spiritual benefits of fasting. If you're a Muslim and you're watching this because you're getting ready for Ramadan, then you obviously already know about the spiritual benefits of fasting and the fact that it is a command of God. If you are not Muslim and you're watching this then you're probably interested in the actual physiological effects of fasting which is beneficial for everyone no matter what your religion is um, so I am going to go into what is the physiological effects of the fast right so in Islam for people who do not know Muslims fast during all of the daylight hours once a year for an entire month. It is 29 or 30 days, depending on the sighting of the new moon. It goes with a lunar calendar. That means that there's no food or drink from sunrise to sunset. Now, this has always been um, an intriguing and interesting part of every spirituality because it's not something that just Muslims do. Jews do it, Christians do it, even people who follow spiritual paths like um, Buddhists and Hindus, they all at some point engage in an abstinence of food and drink. So because we have such a strong human history of fasting, researchers and scientists has begun to study it for a couple of decades now, but a lot of research have been done in the last 10 years or so. And so whereas we call it the fast of Ramadan, <laughs> right? 
Um, it's often referred to as intermittent fasting. So if you want a term to Google to uh, look up some research or some blog or some information, that is what you're going to look up. Look up intermittent fasting. So when we talk about fasting, we are talking about abstaining from all calorie-based food and drink for an extended period of time. So that is the definition of fasting. So we're not talking, and I just like to clarify this, right? We're not, okay, I'm back. <laughs> so we are not talking about, um, I'm doing a detox and we, and I'm drinking juice all day. That is not fasting. You do not get these benefits from doing something like that. So I have to clarify, when we talk about fasting, we're talking about abstaining from all calories. So your digestive system is not doing anything. Your hormones are not interacting with the glucose and the carbs and the fats and the proteins that calories are, based, are bringing in. We're talking about abstaining from all calorie-based food and drink for an extended period of time. So what are some of the benefits of fasting? Well, research shows that there are a lot of benefits to fasting. So I read myself a lot of notes. And then as I was, um, so I'm right in my new book that is out in a couple of months, I tried to write some of the, the important points in this chapter and I just didn't have enough room on the board. So I hope that you will have some tea and you have a, a good listening device, whether you're doing this on your headphones or on your computer, because these are just highlights and I'm gonna explain them to you. So some of the benefits of fasting, these are some of the things that happen in your body when you start to fast, right? So your brain begins to grow, no lie. It is amazing the benefits of fasting that fasting has on the body physiologically. So, brain-derived neurotrophic factors, B, D, and F, right? It is, it was uh, coined by one researcher, um, Miracle Grow for the Brain. So what does B, D, and F do and when does it occur? So when you abstain from food and drink and your body goes into what we used to call starvation mode, your body actually is telling itself, okay, we can take the energy that we normally would use for a digestion and we need to redirect it. Now, there's been a lot of explanation as to why the body does this. And one of the interesting theories is that if we think back before industrialization, when people lived in caves or they were nomads, if you ran out of food or it was a long winter and the vegetation had not come up yet, if you if your brain function decreased as your food decreased, then you would probably starve. So the theory behind it is that the body has this way of preserving itself. So if you don't have food, you need to be really mentally astute so that you can figure out how to get food, how to hunt the animal, how to preserve what you have, how to ration the things that is going to sustain you. So our brain actually creates more connections. So BDNF has been associated with a lot of things. A lack of BDNF has been seen with people with depression. So fasting, has actually been looked at as a form of helping people who have depression because it increases the BDNF. BDNF is responsible for making the connections between neurons and dendrites that improve memory. So you actually have a better way, a better functioning brain to memorize things. It has also been shown as a lack of BDNF has been seen in people with Alzheimer's and with dementia. And so it's believed that as you increase BDNF, you will actually decrease your chances of developing these disease. BDNF literally causes all of the connections in the brain to not just grow, but also to expand which increases cognitive function, your memory, your ability to learn. All of these things happen when you fast. That is one of the great benefits. So when you're fasting and you feel like, oh wow, I just seem like I've been so productive today or I've gotten so much accomplished, that is your brain on miracle growth. <laughs> the second thing that I have listed here
here is autophagy, which I call cellular detox. Now, I am on a mission to get people away from the idea that we can do things that is going to cause our body to detox. But because lots of things that go around on the internet is really not that true, to be honest. Big surprise there, right? So there's very little that we can do naturally that is actually going to cause a detox to happen that was not already happening. Our body has seven ways in which it naturally detoxes itself and we detox all the time. We can adjust what we eat and how we eat in order for our bodies to um, increase the way they, it detoxes. It's the efficiency of the liver, the efficiency of the kidney, but it never stops detoxing. Now, that's a way that we detox the kind of like layer two of what of our body, our liver, our lungs, our kidneys, our skin, all of those things. The one thing that we do not detox when we eat food is our brain and our cellular level on the cellular level of our entire body. Fasting actually detoxes us on a cellular level. This is absolutely amazing. I think I love this more, well, I actually love it all. I can't say, but it's one of my favorite things, right? <laughs> so this is what autophagy is. Autophagy is your cells literally repairing themselves and cleaning themselves. So think of it kind of like your house. When your house gets dusty, your house gets dusty just as a natural part of the environment. It doesn't mean that you're not clean. It doesn't mean that you don't clean up. No matter how much you clean up, you'll still find dust kind of like in different places. So you, st you, you will clean on a regular basis. Well, cellular breakdown is something that naturally occurs with our cells. Sometimes they break. Sometimes they're not good cells. Sometimes they just are used cells and they need to be cleaned out. Well, that is what autophagy does. It kinds of dusts all of your cells and autophagy increases when you are fasting. That is such a huge, huge benefit of fasting because this is the interesting thing that the research shows about autophagy is that it's because of this that it's believed that fasting actually extends the longevity of human beings. It has been shown to increase the lifespan of rats by 300%. And of course, we have not been able to study a human being for 300 years, right? So we, uh, so the, so researchers actually take that study and say, human beings have the same effect when they fast. So it can certainly increase the longevity of a human being. If in these studies, it shows to increase the longevity of, of mice and rats. When you have the cellular turnover and the cellular repair, that is actually what keeps you healthier longer, right? So some of the things that happens to our body that decreases our vitality has to do with simply our cells have been on this earth for a long time and they're just starting to break down. Well, what happens if you can repair those cells? If you can remove the damaged ones before they damage others? That is what autophagy does. So. Cellular detox, detox on a cellular level. So that is something else that it does. I see. And by, if you guys have any questions along the way, just go ahead and post them. I can see, I have my computer here. So if you have a question and go ahead and share this video. This is gonna be a lot of important things that people need to know as we come up on the fast of Ramadan. So the other thing, and we know that lots of us love this, lipolysis is fat burn. <laughs> so fat burn is another benefit of fasting. Your body actually is depleted of its glycogen stores and it begins to use fat in order for it to function. That is a huge plus. Do you know that some that there's a survey that shows that 80% of Muslims lose weight during Ramadan? And when they follow those 80% after three months, 90% of those who lost weight gained it back within three months. 
So that gives us a, that gives us a little indication of knowing what fasting does and then completely reversing it immediately after Ramadan is probably not the best way to go. But I'm going to give you some information today that's going to help you maintain weight loss if that's what you want, right? So the reason why fasting actually increases fat burn is because of the drop in glucose and insulin. So that brings us right to our next one, which is the hormonal domino effect. I couldn't put one thing there because when you fast, it really affects your hormones in such a dramatic way and it begins to domino on other things. So one of the first domino effects that it has is your insulin level. Now, insulin is a key, key hormone when it comes to weight, when it comes to inflammation, when it comes to um, just satiety and feeling hungry all the time. It Once insulin changes its level, all of these other hormones begin to create a domino effect. So insulin is actually a fat storage hormone. So when we are eating lots of carbohydrates, pasta and potatoes and lots of fruit, all of these things are high in glucose, high in carbohydrates. That raises our insulin level. When your insulin level is raised, then your fat burning hormones shut off. The main fat burning hormone, the main hormone is HGH. So when insulin level is up, it blocks HGH, human growth hormone. Now, if you, when you're fasting, your insulin level drops and your HDH increases and increases significantly. One research study showed that after 24 hours, in men, HDH level had increased by 2,300%. And in women, it had increased by 1,300%. So we're not talking about, oh, your HDH level is going to increase by 100%. We're talking about thousands, right? So you go from having a 1 to literally 1,300, right? That's significant. So what does HDH do? It does a couple of things. That's several things actually. One thing that it does is it actually helps you to maintain and grow muscle. One of the uh, one of the negative side effects of weight loss sometimes, if you're not following a specific plan, is you lose fat, but you also lose muscle, and that's not a good thing because your muscle is directly related to your metabolism. So you lose the weight, you lose muscle, but at the end of your weight loss, your metabolism is now slower because for every pound of muscle that you lose, you decrease your metabolism by 50 calories a day. For every pound of muscle that you gain, you increase your metabolism by 50 calories a day. That's 50 calories of you not doing anything else because it takes more energy for your body to um, maintain muscle than it does for it to maintain fat. So HGH actually prevents that muscle loss. So when you lose the weight, you won't gain it back because you have more muscle in order to keep your metabolism raised. HGH actually helps you to build muscle, right? So if you're doing resistance training or HIIT training and your goal is to build muscle, an increase in HGH is going to help you achieve those goals faster. HGH prevents inner injury because it strengthens the muscle fibers, right? So you're not going to get injured as easily. That is a huge plus. The other hormone domino effect is, again, from that insulin decrease, when insulin decreases, it increases the leptin sensitivity. Leptin is a hormone that is determined that helps determine how full we feel, right? The satiety. But that is not the important part of the leptin sensitivity that fasting creates. What happens when it creates leptin sensitivity that your leptin level is directly related to your thyroid level. So people who have thyroid problems, people who suffer from PCOS, fasting can be beneficial in helping regulate the thyroid. So those are just some of the starting benefits of fasting. Um, in addition to that, it not only does um, the insulin sensitivity help you when it comes to weight loss, insulin sensitivity is going to help you avoid um, type 2 diabetes. I must put a little asterisk on this. 
Fasting is really not recommended for people with type 1 diabetes. It's not recommended for them because it, it, the effects of the ketone bodies and the acid, take acetones that are in, that creates the fasting creates is not recommended for type 1 diabetes. So if you have type 1 diabetes, then you want to certainly consult with your doctor before you do anything. Um, the insulin sensitivity that fasting creates is not just beneficial for um, not just beneficial for um, people who are trying to avoid type 2 diabetes has actually been used to treat type 2 diabetes along with their medication and has been shown has shown great results now some of the things that I did not get a chance to put on this is it also helps if you have high cholesterol so one of the things that happens when you fast is your insulin level drops your body uses all of this glucose and then it begins to um, it, it, it begins to metabolize your own fat and create what's called ketones now what ketones are is when your liver no longer has any glucose so it has does it doesn't have all of the leftovers from uh, the the carbs that you've consumed during your eating and so your liver now taps into fat It can be either dietary fat or your body fat and it converts that into ketones Which is a nut which is an alternative form of energy for the body, right? So the way that it works with cholesterol is your cholesterol is lipids which is fats that is in your blood when your liver needs to convert some fat into ketones it is going to go with the most readily available which is the which is the lipids in your blood so it significantly reduces and helps people who have high cholesterol to reduce their cholesterol those are just some of the benefits of fasting so i am i want to see if you have any questions real quick Okay, no questions yet. Awesome. Well, if you have questions, go ahead and post them there. Um, all right, so now let's go into what is actually happening hour by hour in your body when you fast. So the first meal of the day that the Muslims eat during the month of Ramadan is called Sohor, right? If you're not Muslim, it's just the, the last meal that you're eating before your fast starts, right? So it takes about four hours for most foods to digest. So the first four hours, your stomach is digesting the food that you've eaten. It is distributing, and I'm going to go off of the assumption that we, that you're eating a, a rounded um, diet, that you're eating carbs, you're eating protein, you're eating fat, right? So this is based on all of that. So the first four hours, your stomach is digesting your food. So every food category actually takes a different amount of time to digest. So for example, it takes about 20 minutes for water to go through your system. It takes about an hour for you to digest a piece of fruit. It takes about four hours for you to digest uh, some chicken or animal protein such as chicken. Um, so. The first four hours, your body is digesting your food, it's taking out the nutrients, it's delivering glucose to your blood, all of that has happened in the first four hours. Now, when you get to hour six, then now we're going into hour six, now your intestinal digestion is completing itself. So now the food has gone through your body, through your stomach. I'm going on the assumption that you had some chicken or some fish or something like that, right? And so now your in intestinal digestion is, is completing. Now, it takes about 12 hours for everything to filter through into your liver. So if you don't know, the liver is the last organ that actually processes all of the calories and food that you eat. So it's the last organ to determine whether or not a calorie is going to be burned as fuel or it's going to be stored as fat. It is the last organ that receives all of the leftover nutrients and toxins and all of the things that were 
not, your body is not able to metabolize. So the liver is super important. You probably already know it's our number one detoxing organ. We would not be able to live without our liver because it detoxes our body on a constant basis. We are constantly coming in contact with things that we should not be in contact with that that is dangerous to us or toxic to us. And this is not something that's just happened when we had in an industrial age. You know, when people lived in the forest, they came across snake venom and poison berries. And it's just the world that we live in. And the body is such an amazing machine that it's built to deal with this in our environment. No matter if you live in the middle of the Amazon or in the middle of Brooklyn, which is a whole nother forest <laughs> jungle, right? <laughs> so 12 hours, your body is completing its, your liver is completing its um, detoxification process. It is also at this point that your liver is pretty much depleted. It's used all of the glucose and assigned it for everywhere that it needed to go. If you ate, you know, too much pasta, it's stored it as it's storing it as fat right now. If you um, if you've eaten something uh, that is high in protein, then it is it's taking out as much glucose as it can because the number one. So this is important when I talk about glucose. Glucose is the body's preferred way of of um, preferred energy source. So, and I, when I say energy, I don't want you to think um, energy like just for us to have energy to run or exercise. You need energy just to live, right? You have a basal metabolic rate. That is the amount of calories that you need even if you was to lay on the couch all day and watch Hulu, right? So your, in order for your lungs to breathe, your heart to beat, blood to flow around your body, you need energy for that to happen. Now, your body prefers glucose. It is the number one. But when glucose is depleted, so this is something that happens when you're fasting, the body has no glucose. Our body is such an amazing machine that it actually has an auxiliary auxiliary energy system. And that is using ketones. So ketones that are made from fat. So once your glucose is depleted, now the body says, well, I have no more glucose. It's time to kick in the generator. And that generator is, let's grab some fat. We know we have some in dietary fat as well as in body fat and we're going to use that to produce energy right the that's at 12 hours right also autophagy begins to happen so when you and and i wanted to break this down hour by hour because oftentimes we um when we think about fasting, we think, oh my God, it's so long, especially now, like Ramadan in the Western Hemisphere anyway, is like summer, spring. A couple of years ago, we were fasting like 18 straight hours. That was actually good for us, right? So autophagy begins to happen. This is when your cellular detox starts to happen. So if you're fasting for 13 hours, 14 hours, those last two hours when you are feeling a little tired, when you need that energy to kick in, I want you to think about some of the things that's happening inside uh, physiologically and how much it is benefiting, benefiting you. Um, hour 12, now we have autophagy. I'm sorry, I'm just looking at my comments and questions. Okay, I see your questions, Bushra, Khalida, Iman, Farah. I see your questions and I will get to them. All right, so now you're at 12 hours. 16 hours, that is when the real fat burn starts to happen. It starts to pick up significantly here. But then when your fast has reached between 18 and 20 hours, this is the greatest fat burn, right? So if you're doing intermittent fasting and you may start off, if you've never fasted before, say, well, I'm gonna fast 12 hours a day. Okay, that's great for health, right? When you go, I'm gonna fast 16 hours, that's really good for increasing your fat burn. 
But if you can make it to the full 18 to 20 hours, and it's not something that you need to do every single day, you have the greatest lipolysis. So people who engage in fasting for longer than this, lipolysis still occurs, but not at the same rate. So the scale looks sort of like, I'm going to, I'm going to get rid of this. So here is sort of what the research scale looks like when they look at when you have the greatest lipolysis during fasting, right? So they looked at people who fasted for 12 hours, for um, 18, let's go 18, let's go 20, let's go 24, let's go 36, and let's go uh, 48, right? They looked at people throughout the, the time that they were fasting. And let's say that this is lipolysis. Right? So lipolysis actually, uh, the amount of fat burn that's happening, let's start up here. So it starts off very gradual, um, say like this, like this, like this. And then between hours 18 and 20, there is a huge drop. And then it starts to even out like that, right? So it still happens, but it happens very gradually after that. So ideally, if your goal is fat loss, so I'm coming a little bit out of Ramadan mode, and you wanted to incorporate this as a means for you to lose weight, then ideally you would fast a couple of days a week for 20 hours a day and then you eat and you continue your regular and then maybe on non-consecutive days you want to do this so that's kind of like what the scale looks like when they research where fat burn happens when you are fasting so that's really that's a good thing to know so now you made it to the hour 20 what happens at 24 hours? So this is where the exciting stuff with HGH happens that I mentioned earlier. One research showed that for men, the, their HGH increased 2,000%. And for women, 1,300% after 24 hours of fasting. That is significant. So some of the things that also happens when you're fast, when we look at... Um, Fasting in terms of, of days, right? So I was reading one research study and it showed that when people, they looked at three things. They looked at um, dopamine, they looked at serotonin, and they looked at HGH. HGH increased significantly after three days. Serotonin increased significantly after three days. Dopamine pretty much stayed the same. So we know that fasting significantly increases your serotonin and your HGH levels. Those are some of the, those are all many of the benefits of fasting. Okay, so let's talk about how we fast in a way that is not only beneficial for us physically, but how do you continue to achieve your health and fitness goals throughout the fast? So one of the questions, um, I'm going to actually write the question on the board so that when people go back and watch this, you can kind of like fast forward and see what question I'm on. <laughs> okay. So let's take question one, which is how do you get enough water? If you're going 20 hours a day, while you're fasting. Okay, so water intake. My standard rule for water is that you should drink half your body weight in ounces of water a day. Now this can be a little challenging when you are fasting, particularly when you're doing the uh, 20 hour fast. So that's another reason why I wouldn't recommend that you do that every single day, right? So here's a little interesting thing, uh, a little interesting side note as far as, far as the frequency of fasting, right? So 
scientifically when we look at when they looked at kind of like what is the most beneficial way of fasting a daily fast an every other day fast a two time a week fast which one actually had the greatest benefits and the greatest longevity among people who could just practice it as a practical way now the finding of science scientists have actually just reaffirmed what the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said in Hadith. We as Muslims, we know the every other day fast as the fast of David or the fast of Dawood, right? He would fast, the Prophet Dawood would fast every other day. We know it as that. And then there is a Sunnah, which is a tradition in Islam that is recommended that you fast every Monday and Thursday. And the Prophet Sallallahu said, this is the best way to fast. And scientists looked at all of the different ways of fasting and they actually, they actually came to the conclusion that it is actually the best way for people to maintain it as a lifestyle. So that's really important for you to know. So when I talk about fasting for health, you don't necessarily have to do it on a daily basis for the rest of your life, right? When you're trying to achieve a goal like weight loss, it may be beneficial for you to do it, um, to do some intermittent fasting, say 16 or 18 hours for a couple of months. But as a lifestyle for long term, it's not necessary unless you have other particular goals. When you have to intake your water, you want to take in water about every 20 minutes, right? couple of things to note outside of Ramadan if you are doing the fast on a daily basis for weight loss for example or for an increase in HGH then you can drink water while you're fasting now we know during Ramadan we do not drink water while we're fasting but if you're doing it on a, as an intermittent fasting lifestyle or um, eating method then there are three things that is allowed during the fast. You can have black coffee, you can have tea with no sweeteners, not even artificial sweeteners, and or sweeten, sweetener substitutes. I say don't have either of those. Um, and you can have water. So if you're going to have water, you want to have water about 20. So first thing is half your body weight in water a day. So if you weigh 200 pounds, then you should be drinking 100 ounces of water a day. You determine the amount of water you need based on your weight. If you exercise, for every hour that you're exercising, you should, you should add two cups of water to that, so about 16 ounces. Um, so the half your body weight is like the base level of what you should be drinking. Now you want to drink that in 20, every 20 minutes, drink about 20 ounces. I mentioned earlier that it takes about 20 minutes for water to go through your system. In order for you, in order for your body to benefit from it um, the most, meaning water is great because our organs and our muscle absorb it. If you sat down and you drunk, you know, two liters of water, you're basically just going to pee it all out <laughs> because your body doesn't can't even absorb that amount of water. But if you do it in 20 minutes, in 20 ounces, about 20 ounces, 16, 20 ounces every 20 minutes, then your body will more efficiently absorb and use the water, right? So when you have really sore muscles, one of the best things to do is to make sure that you're really hydrated. So say you had a hard workout or you just had a workout and you're sore. Make sure that you're hydrated. And hydrated doesn't mean drinking an entire, you know, gallon of water while you're at the gym. That's actually not very beneficial for you. So for all of you gym heads who are so proud to bring your gallon of water into the gym with you, that's not really the most efficient way to, to, to drink water. Every 20 ounces is about every 20 minutes. Next question. I had another question. How about people with heartburn and acid reflux? So heartburn and acid reflux are both a, uh, is gonna result from you eating. So 
<laughs> I'm sorry, I had a little interruption. Heartburn and acid reflux are both um, has to do with what you're eating. So if you are decreasing what you're eating and you are watching what you're eating when you do break your fast, that's something that we also have to get into. So what do you eat when you break your fast? Um, then you will actually see an improvement in that. Um, how the best time of day to Second question was about heartburn. And so the third question we have is when to exercise. Okay, so this is a really important question, particularly if weight loss is your goal or muscle strength is your goal. There are two types of exercises we're gonna talk about. We're gonna talk about cardiovascular exercise and we're gonna talk about resistance training, right? So, if you are doing cardiovascular exercise, you can exercise anytime during your fast. It really doesn't make a, um, a difference in, in your fat burn if you exercise, you know, two hours before you break your fast versus five hours before you break your fast if you are doing cardio. So what I would suggest that you do is if you are going, if for example, you have to work out in the morning, right? On almost every day that you do. Do cardio in the morning. I do not, and I repeat, do not recommend that you do resistance training or any muscle anaerobic exercise while you are fasting in the middle of the day or in the morning. Why not? Because after you are done breaking down your muscle fibers and working your muscles so hard, your muscles need to repair themselves. And they are looking for calories and food to do that. If they don't find it, then they are going to cannibalize itself. So, you have about, we used to think that it was about an hour. Now, it, some research shows that you may have as much as three hours to actually eat. I would suggest that you meet it somewhere in between and go like two hours. So when you exercise, when you do resistance training, you need to eat a food source, a meal within two hours of you completing your workout. That would be my recommendation. So in Ramadan, really focus. If you have to work out in the morning, then I would suggest that you really use that 30 days to up your cardiovascular um, conditioning. It is not a time for you to up your resistance training if you only can work out in the morning. So that's important. Now, if you have the ability to work out right before iftar or right after iftar, which is the break fast meal, then hey, go for the weights, go for the resistance training. And when I say cardio, I mean pure cardio, steady state cardio, I am not talking about HIIT training. So resistance training is anything with weights, any type of interval training, where you are any body weight exercises, other than running, right? When we talk about cardio, we're talking about run, swim, um, bike, right? All of those are cardio. Classes like Zumba, right? That's all cardio. Once you start adding squats, lunges, push-ups into the workout, it's now a resistance training workout. I, I want to also remind you of what we talked about earlier is that when you want to lose weight, you do not want to lose muscle because the weight will come off, but part of that weight will be your muscle and your metabolism will be slower in the end. So you don't wanna do that. Um, Safiatu wants to know, how do I balance my hormones? That is an unclear question, so I cannot answer that. I'm not sure what you mean by that because I don't know what hormones you need to balance. Um, uh, 
Okay. I think I answered all of the questions so far. If you have any other questions, I'm gonna give you a few more minutes to um, go ahead and answer them. I want to point out a couple of things about, um, oh, I know what we were supposed to talk about. We're supposed to be talking about how do you maintain, what do you eat after you are um, done fasting? So. I want to bring attention to one of the most important things that happens while you're fasting, which is your insulin level drops, right? When your insulin level drops, all of the great things around fat loss, around autophagy, so all of these things that are happening, lipolysis, autophagy, HGH, that is the hormonal domino. And the number one, the first one in the row of dominoes is insulin. When your insulin level drops, it signals all of these things to get to work. It signals lipolysis to get to work. It, it signals HGH to start pumping up. It signals autophagy to start working and moving. to get, It is sin, signals BDNF. It is all about your insulin. So even if you are eating, if you can maintain a lower insulin level, you will still have some of this stuff going on even when you are not fasting. So what does that mean? So this is a part of kind of like the part I know people really don't want to hear, <laughs> but I need to tell you. So that means that when you break your fast, you don't want to give yourself a huge insulin boost, right? Dates are really, really high in sugar. You should not be sitting down and eating five dates. You should have one date. One is the sunnah, anyway. You don't want to break your fast with an entire bowl of pasta, right? Because when that happens, I shouldn't say you don't want to. You don't, that's not the best way. For you to eat after you are done fasting because once you've achieved all of these benefits because your insulin level dropped down you don't want to reverse make all of this stuff stop because you decided to spike your insulin up super high so one of the best um eating methods for eating methods that combined with fasting is actually a ketogenic eat me eating methods i don't have time to get into it today I will do a live maybe next week and we will talk about ketogenic eating. But that is actually the best way for you to multiply all of the benefits of fasting even when you are not fasting, right? So you want to decrease the amount of carbohydrates you have in your diet. So that is a decrease in sugar, um, that's a decrease in uh, grains and pasta and juices and fruit, high, high um, sugar fruits, right? So you want to look at things like the glycemic load. And I'm giving you kind of like a little overview and I can't go into a lot of detail because I've already been talking for almost an hour. Um, but those are some of the things that you want. So a good iftar may be for you to have some, a protein source and a large amount of vegetables with some grass-fed butter on it, right? So that would be a good iftar meal. If you can do that throughout Ramadan, what's going to happen is because of the, de the continued decrease in glucose in your system, your body will use ketones longer. You will not feel hungry during the day. You will have all of these benefits of BDNF, lipolysis, autophagy, all of those things happening on a continuum basis. So if you can imagine if you fasted 16 hours a day and all of these things happen in 16 hours and then you eat a huge meal here and they just stop. And then you start again from the top and they happen for 16 hours and then they stop. As opposed to this happening for 30 days straight. That's the difference that it can make. Um, if you are interested in learning how to combine intermittent fasting with a ketogenic diet, you can go to mr40method.com and I am taking in a new group of women 
who can do the program with me and uh, learn how to incorporate the two of them together. Um, and we start next week, so you want to go ahead and go to that. Um, do you mean protein and veggies? Ian, can you clarify that question? So when you post a comment, can you please do a complete question? Because there is a delay from me speaking to you to me seeing the questions. So you may be posting when I'm saying a particular thing, but I'm not going to see it while I'm saying that thing. So it's a delay. So I need you to... Um, make sure that that you post an entire question okay. i think we answered that we answered the i see a question that says what's the best things to eat okay so let's do a couple of things for best foods for sahur or your first meal And for iftar, for your breakfast. So again, we want to talk about what are some of the best foods that you can have for Sahur. The best foods for you to have for Sahur is something that has um, a good healthy fat in it because that is actually going to keep you satisfied longer and something that's lower in carbohydrates. So we often get up and you may have pancakes and waffles and cereal and all of those things spike your insulin level. And we talked about insulin and how it is the first domino in a hormonal domino effect, right? For all of these things to happen. Well, you don't want that to happen during Sahur because what's gonna happen is not only does insulin spike, when insulin spike, it actually causes you to be more hungry. So you want to avoid that, right, as much as we possibly can, even though we know, you know, there's, we're, we're going to be hungry and we do try to minimize it, right? It's nothing, um, that it's, it's such an experience when you're sitting in a business meeting and your stomach starts talking out loud, right? <laughs> such an experience. <laughs> so you want to actually avoid that and you can by having a good healthy fat I would suggest something like all right I apologize about that I'm um, we keep having these interruptions because I'm using my phone and people are calling me <laughs> so so whore, I would suggest that you do something like um, a, a couple of eggs whole eggs, not just egg whites, have the fat part. So eggs are a very interesting food because all of the fat is inside of the yolk, the yellow part in the middle, and all of the protein is inside of the white, which is the, the egg white on the outside. So have the entire egg, right? You know you're not going to gain fat for eating fat because remember when I talked about before is that the way that um, our, what happens here when our liver actually depletes it keep, its, keep, its uh, glucose, it actually starts to look for fat so that it can convert it to ketones. So your body will process it. They actually show that despite eating fat in the morning or any time throughout your non-fasting period, the, H, the LDL for people who fast decreases because your body literally uses it for energy. So I would suggest that and maybe um, adding, have it as an omelet, right? You don't have to have toast with omelet. Um, but if you choose to have toast, have one slice, don't have four, right? So we want to decrease. So I want to meet you where you are. Don't want to give you something that's super hard to do. But especially since like if you're not a part of my coaching program, if you're a part of my coaching program, then we're going to go through this together during Ramadan. Um, but for people who are not, I want to make sure that it is something that you're able to handle. So think about what you normally eat and identify the carbohydrates in that and think about how you can decrease that. So if that means you normally have three pieces of toast with your omelet, maybe you want to have one, right? If you normally have 
an entire bowl of fruit, you might want to just have like a half of a pear, something that's low on the glycemic load. So you want to think about how you can decrease it um, during, the, during Ramadan. I am... Ellie says, doing yoga and Pilates is okay during the fast. So it depends on what types, right? A lot of people think that yoga is um, meditation and super easy and relaxing. There are types of power yoga and vinyasa yoga that can be very, um, they can be very anaerobic, which means that they really do work your muscles and you do it and when you're really sore. So if you're doing yoga for just a stretching um, routine or a stretching class, then that would absolutely be fine. If you're doing yoga and you're holding prayer pose for an entire two minutes, then that might stress your muscles if you're going to be sore after. So the key is, if it's a class that's going to make your muscles sore when you are done, then you want to hold. You want to consider that resistance training. You want to hold off until about two hours before you break your fast or after your fast. So, yoga and Pilates. Okay, so Ian said that she, the question was, so I'm going to I'm going to put the two together. So I was talking about iftar, and she wanted to know if that means a protein and a veggie. So here is the only thing that I have to say about. So I said for the iftar meal, you don't want to just have protein and veggies. Number one, I'm not recommending that you have a high protein diet. Protein should always be moderate. One of the main reasons that protein can be moderate, I'm going to take you right back to insulin. When your body does not have carbohydrates in order to create insulin, it can actually create insulin and glucose from protein. So if you're eating and you're breaking your fast with, hey, I'm just going to have a whole bunch of hot wings because, hey, it doesn't have any carbs. Sorry, that does not work because it still will raise your insulin level. And when your insulin level is raised, these things don't happen. So I would say a moderate amount of protein. You're going to have some veggies, but also really important is that you put fat on those veggies or on that protein. So sal salmon is a good, um, is a good high fat uh, fish. Catfish is a good high fat fish. So if you're talking about just having a protein that has high fat, if you are... Um, having veggies, throwing some co a tablespoon of coconut, stir frying them with a tablespoon of coconut oil, or you can put it on top, you can do that too. Um, Grass-fed butter on top of that, stir frying it with olive oil, and not like pan spray, but actually pouring the oil inside of that. That fat is going to be used as, um, it's going to be used as fuel. But I must give you a caveat. If you are going to have protein and veggies and then turn around and have a half a dozen of Dunkin' Donuts, or even if you're gonna have a chocolate eclair, right? You're still going to um, mitigate the effects because it's not just what you're eating on their plate. Your body is taking into account all of the things that you're eating. So remember all of those things. So again, I'm not saying don't have dessert during Ramadan and don't eat sugar at all. What I'm saying is that it shouldn't be a daily thing, right? So it should be something that you engage in a couple of times a month, e even if you want to do it once a week. But it shouldn't be, we tend to go to the other extreme in Ramadan, right? So we fast all day, we get all of these benefits, and then we break our fast and we're overeating. We're eating all types of, you know, people want to, and this is, of course, to get your buttercups, you want to um, donate and bring a potluck meal to the masjid or to an iftar, and often you try to maximize the way that is shared by lots of rice and lots of pasta. And alhamdulillah, it's not that those things are completely horrible, 
But if you're a person that's coming to the masjid, don't fill your plate up with that, right? You want to have that in moderation. Hot or cold water after breaking your fast? It does not matter. <laughs> so let's put that six. My answer to that is it doesn't matter. Just drink water. I don't get, so here's just my own personal philosophy when suggesting for people to drink water. I really try to balance my recommendations based on both, not just what the science and research tells us, but also to how can that be practically applied for most people. 80% of people do not drink enough water. 80% of people are not drinking a half a, uh, half your body weight in water a day. If you start putting restrictions on it, like, oh, it has to be alkaline, it has to be distilled, it has to be this, it has to be hot, it has to be cold, it's just going to decrease the amount of water that you drink because you're going to think it needs to be something special. Just drink water. I don't care if you get it out the tap water. Well, if you live in Flint, you might not want to do that, but you get my point. Just drink water. It doesn't, there's no definitive research that hot or cold does anything special to your body, right? So if for health benefits, the, this is where you're going to get your main health benefits. Just drink water. Having the water in your system is more important than how it goes into your body. Mm. I think I answered all of the questions about Sahur and Iftar. Um, so Bushra is asking me again about um, acid reflux. Things like acid reflux, you really just need to know what causes your acid reflux. Generally, it's acidic things like orange juice and tomatoes and things like that. Just don't eat them, right? I don't have a special answer. Um, but when you have something that is specifically related to food, you just avoid that food. Um, okay, so hopefully you guys were, you received a lot of benefit from the chat today. Thank you for logging on and asking all of your questions. You can do me a favor if you've benefited from this and share this on your wall, in your groups, any place that you think that might be helpful for people to learn about the physiological benefits of both fasting in Ramadan and doing intermittent fasting as a lifestyle. Um, so it doesn't just have to be shared in Muslim groups, right? So it can be shared in um, various types of groups that may be interested in just the health effects of fasting. So do me a favor and give it a share. And if you want to learn more about how you can incorporate intermittent fasting um, and the other aspects of weight loss that um, I am that I coach my group through, then you can go to mr40method.com and you can join the wait list. We open up next week. And by joining the wait list, you will actually get registration privileges a full 48 hours before I open it up to everybody else and I post it here on the wall. So I will also post it here on the Fit Muslim My page, but um, if you want early access, because I'm only accepting 50 women the first time, it filled up pretty quickly and we're doing it again. So you want to make sure that you uh, get access early. All right. So I will also post that inside of the comments. Thank you very much for joining me and uh, inshallah I will try to do another live next week um, and we will talk a little bit more about actually how to eat during Ramadan. All right. Assalamu alaikum.